All right, hey, if you've got a Bible this morning, would you go ahead and start making your way to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. If you've got a paper Bible today and you need some help finding Jonah, go about three quarters of the way to the end of it and start turning back to the left. If you find Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, just start going to the left and you'll find Jonah before too long. Or you can grab a, a phone and an app like the Version app or the Bible app and uh, find Jonah pretty quick. But we'll be in Jonah chapter 3 today. As uh, we continue this series, we've called Unsinkable. We're looking at the story of Jonah that's mostly found in his book called Jonah. But uh, part of the deal that we've said all along is uh, this is one of those stories, the story of Jonah... It's full of surprises. Uh, whether you grew up in church or didn't grow up in church at all, Jonah's one of those stories that most of us feel like we know, and yet when we start to look at it, discover we weren't that familiar with at all. And so uh, we're going to wrap up the book of Jonah actually today, but not the series and not the story of Jonah until next week, because next week we're going to look at the sequel to Jonah's story in the Bible. Did you know that Jonah had a sequel in the Bible? It's there. It's just one more of those surprises, and we'll get to it next week. But, uh, you know, one of the funny things, so I was this week, I was talking to one of my neighbors, doesn't go to church, uh, but he knows what I do, and he asked me what I was talking about this week, and I said, huh, actually talking about Jonah and the worm. And he said, you mean Jonah and the whale? I said, no, I'm talking about Jonah and the worm this week. He said, oh, gosh, I, I always thought Jonah was a story about a whale. I'm like, well, it's not, so, like, you should read your Bible, you know? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. But the truth is, the story of Jonah is as much about a worm as it is about a whale. And it's really not even a story about Jonah either. It's a story about us. And ultimately, a story about a God whose mercy and mission are unsinkable, even when his messengers stink. That's what we're continuing to look at today. If you're just hopping into the series, I can catch you up pretty quick. Uh, God comes to this guy that he's designed for a purpose, and he says to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. Go to your enemies and give them the message that I'll tell you to give them. And Jonah doesn't want to go to them, so he says no. And immediately when he detaches from God's design, his life starts to sink. And the story tells us literally he goes down to Joppa, down to a port, down to a boat, down on the boat, down to a bed, down into a deep sleep, down into the ocean, and down into the depths of a fish. He finds himself at rock bottom because he's detached from God's design. And yet even there, deserving none of it, he discovers that God has pursued him there. That God is present with him, even in the circumstances of his own making. He's lower than rock bottom. He says, I'm at the roots of the mountains. God's provided a way out for him. And at the end of chapter 2, the original vomit comet is hurled back towards God's, in, sorry, is sent back towards God's design. Okay, so you want to know the Hebrew word for vomit? Give you a little Hebrew lesson. You want to know the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for vomit? Here it is. You can practice saying it. Is this. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Two and a half years of Hebrew got me that for you today. Also that I could get to the dad joke. So Jonah chapter 1, Jonah's called according to God's purpose and God's design to show God's mercy. Jonah chapter 3, Jonah is called towards God's purpose and God's design, towards God's mission with God's mercy. Jonah chapter 3. Sorry. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Look how the story continues. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Now, if you've been with us in the series, that's familiar language. It's the exact same thing that God's told Jonah before. Jonah gets to retake his test. God says, arise and go, and this time Jonah gets up and goes to Nineveh, where he preaches, get this, an eight-word sermon. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Eight-word sermon, five words in Hebrew. So I hear you. Where can I find a preacher like that? Just know the preacher's asking, where can I find a congregation that responds like this? <laughs> Notice what happens, verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. 
Okay, how many of them responded to this message? All of them. 100% of the people present hear Jonah's sermon, which several scholars point out is not even a good sermon. Like it's just half of the message. And it's not even the good part of the message. It's the bad news part of the message. And yet God had so pursued these Ninevites and prepared their hearts that when Jonah bungles the message, 100% of the people respond. They respond with a decision. And then they follow up their decision with devotion. You notice both of those are there. The Ninevites believed God. That's the decision. But notice the decision wasn't just an impulsive, emotional decision. Okay, this is not last night of church camp kind of decision. You remember church camp, some of you? Did you experience church camp? You know how church camp went? Like the whole week prepared for the last night. And the last night somebody would get up and preach a message like Jonah's message. Like 40 days to get your act together or God's going to get you. And then the band would come out and the band would start to play and the music would begin to build and the people would start to cry and everybody would start promising. You know, this is like every, every summer, promising all of the stuff that we're going to do and we're going to go back and we're going to be different and I'm never going to do it again. And then we go back and a week later, it wear off. You remember the last night of church camp? That's not what this is. Was the decision legitimate? Sure it was at church camp. You meant it with your whole heart. At least you meant to mean it with your whole heart. But it was a decision, come on, that didn't get any devotion attached to it. Check out the Ninevites. They make a decision to respond to something that they believe is true about God. They decide, I'm going to put some things in place to make sure that I can't drift from a decision. That's devotion. They put on sackcloth. So I think burlap sack made out of horse hair or goat hair. Like it just kind of makes you itchy even thinking about it, doesn't it? That's the whole point. They're choosing discomfort to keep them from getting distracted from their decision. If you keep reading where it gets to the king, he does it too. And then he takes it to the next level. Puts on sackcloth and he proclaims a fast. He says, don't eat or drink from the least to the greatest, from the youngest to the oldest, from the richest to the poorest. And not only that, your livestock, your animals, your cat, your dog, your cows. If you're reading the story, you think, now hang on a second, what do the animals do wrong? But if you've ever been around a cattle operation when the cows are hungry, you know exactly what's going on here. It's louder than a football game. The king is proclaiming something and deciding something that he's going to put in place that's a multi-sensory reminder of the decision that they've made to keep them attached to it so they can't possibly get comfortable. They're saying, all of the Ninevites, 100% of them, we're going to make the decision to believe God in this, but here's what we know about us. We're not great at believing God in stuff. We're likely to make a decision to believe in God about something and then go to lunch, then go watch the Cowboys game, watch a little golf, take a little nap, and forget all about it. But we're not going to let that happen. So again, Jonah's living every preacher's dream. There is a line out of the Next Step Center in Nineveh a mile long, and 100% of the people are in it. This is what Jonah is designed for. This is what Jonah was called to. This is what Jonah was afraid of. Look how Jonah responds, chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. You hear what Jonah's saying? He said, God, I knew this would happen. I knew you would do this, God. I knew you were too good to be trusted with yourself. I knew you would do the wrong thing 
not destroy these people like they deserve to be destroyed. I knew you were weak, God, an irrational God, overly emotional God. You're too good for your own good, God, and that's not good. Here we are. God says to Jonah in verse 4, the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? God wants to make sure that Jonah sees what you and I see because we've had a behind-the-scenes look at Jonah's story. We know where Jonah's been. Remember what Jonah remembered when he was in the belly of the fish? I'm dying. Remember what the Ninevites realized when Jonah proclaimed that five-word message to them? We're dying. Why were the Ninevites dying? Because they turned their back on God and run in the direction of gods they could manage instead. Why was Jonah dying in the belly of the fish? Because Jonah had run away from God and turned instead to a god that he can manage. What did Jonah realize in the belly of the fish? He learned where to turn for salvation. What have the Ninevites realized through Jonah's five-word sermon? They have the exact same story. And Jonah's totally blind to it. Jonah is the poster child for missions, but he's totally missed God's mission. So that's designed to ask a question, get us to ask a question, isn't it? Like, what in the world is going on here? How does this happen? Where does this come from? And ultimately, is it possible that could happen to me? Look what happens, verse 5. Jonah had gone out, rise and go, Jonah had gone out and <laughs> sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat down in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Okay, notice God's working. Where's Jonah? Jonah's on the outside of the place that God's working, and his life has begun to sink again. Verse 6, then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So this is the first moment in the whole book that Jonah's been happy about anything. Why is he happy? Well, the passage tells us he's happy because he's the recipient of God's provision and he likes that. He's happy because he's comfortable. That's important. But it's short-lived. Look at verse 7. At dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. You see what's going on in God's object lesson for Jonah. Jonah's comfortable. Jonah's happy. Jonah's uncomfortable. Jonah wants no part of God's plan for his life. So notice, Jonah responds to the plant the exact same way that Jonah responds to the response of Nineveh. And God uses the exact same words to respond to Jonah. He's tying the two images together. Look what happens in verse 9. God says to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. God, this is not what I signed up for when I signed up for a life that's connected to you. I signed up for a life where you would take care of me, where you would make me comfortable, where you'd provide all my needs and all of my wants, and you would use me in the exact way that I want to be used, with the people who are like me and who like me. I signed up to have someone supernatural, 
accomplish my purpose for my life and my will for the world. And if you love me and have the power to make me comfortable, God, I expect you to do that. And if you're not going to do that, I'd rather disobey or even die than follow you. Do you see the incredible irony here? That this very moment, the most evil people on the planet, the people that Jonah believes deserve God's mercy the least, are choosing discomfort so that they don't drift from devotion. While Jonah, the prophet and messenger of God, is willing to disobey and die when God even allows a little bit of temporary discomfort in his life. Look at verse 10. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Jonah, can we get things in perspective here? Like, you're asking me to destroy your life because of a plant. A plant that you've had less than 24 hours to fall in love with. Like the bachelor gets more time to fall in love with people than you've had with that plant. You didn't plant the plant, Jonah. You didn't nourish the plant or nurture the plant. You didn't have a plan for the plant. You didn't water the plant. You didn't tend the plant or cultivate the seed. You had no vision for the plant or hopes for the plant. The plant just happened overnight. And your whole identity is tied up in that plant to the point that you would rather disobey me and die than lose that plant. Is that about right, Jonah? You notice Jonah doubles down. He's, that's about right, God. It is. And don't even pretend like you love that plant. Because if you love that plant, and if you love me, you'd never even think about destroying it. And God says... Now, that's an interesting argument, Jonah. Look at verse 11. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Like, here's the deal, Jonah. I did plant the plant. I had a plan for the plant and a purpose for the plant and a good purpose towards you with that plant. You see that city out there in the distance? I created them, those people too. I formed them fearfully and wonderfully. I know them individually. I know what they're good at. I know what they're bad at. I know what they're capable of. I know what they're not capable of. I love those people, Jonah. I've got a whole lot more invested in those people that I've placed near you than you ever had in the plant I placed near you. God makes it really clear what Jonah's issue is. And hasn't then this been Jonah's issue the whole time? Jonah is only willing to consider God's calling when it's connected to his own personal comfort. He's only willing to consider God's calling when it's connected to his own personal comfort. When it really truly came down to it, the only part of Life with God that Jonah cared to commit to are the parts that made him personally comfortable. But God is gently saying to Jonah, Jonah, look at your life. When you prioritize comfort over calling, come on, you normally miss both. Because you live a life that's disconnected from compassion. My compassion through you, but also my compassion to you. God's trying to get Jonah not just to comply. A lot of times we think that's what God is up to with us. He's just trying to get us to comply. God's not just trying to get Jonah to comply. He's not just trying to get Jonah to embrace God's mission because it's the right thing to do. He's inviting him to discover the best way to live. And look how Jonah responds. Look down at verse 12. Well, that's weird. Can we get verse 12 up on the screen maybe? I don't have it on, sorry, that's embarrassing. I don't, for whatever reason, I don't have, I guess, verse 12 in my Bible. Um, could one of you read it? 
Just read it real loud. Anybody got verse 12? What do you mean there's no verse 12? How does the story resolve? How does it end? Where does it go? What does the messenger of God do in response to the message? You realize that's the point, right? It's written to ask a question. And you realize who it's designed to ask the question of. It's not Jonah. It's you. It's really a postmodern way of writing, isn't it? We told you at the very beginning, chapter 1, the story begins with the word and. That shows us it's a story that's set inside of another story. And it's a story that doesn't resolve at the end. Like, think about this. You'd flunk high school English with a story like this, but you might win a Pulitzer Prize. Because it's a story that's designed to show you that it's a story that you fit inside of. And it's a story that's designed to ask you a question. How does the messenger respond on the mission of God with the mercy of God, even in moments when it's uncomfortable for me? The question isn't how does Jonah respond. The question is how will I? Here's the question Jonah's whole story sets us up to respond to. It's this. Is God's compassion a higher value than my personal comfort? Is God's compassion a higher value than my personal comfort? Isn't that the question? And come on, let's be really, really honest with ourselves in a moment like this. Like, come on, in our heart of hearts isn't the reason that some of us are holding God at arm's length in some area of our life that we're afraid if we followed him there it would lead us to something that's outside our comfort zone? Isn't it why if someone was to ask us, God made you on purpose and sent you on purpose with a purpose for the place that he sent you, what's your purpose? How are you sent and where? And is there a step you've taken towards it this week? Most of us would just have to say, man, I, like questions like that are not even really on my radar. It's not that I don't have any compassion for people that God's placed me around and people that God's placed around me. I do. And I'm willing to take steps towards them. I show and tell who God is and what he's really like wherever I'm sent. As long as God's compassion and his mission stay inside my comfort zone. And sometimes we kind of push against that like Jonah because the people that we know we're sent towards are people who are not like us, who don't like us, and frankly, people that we don't like. They're our enemies. And yet, sometimes we resist God's mission to show and tell who he's like, the places that we're sent, because the people we're sent towards are friends. They're people that live near us. They're people that live with us. And we tell ourselves that it's our compassion that keeps us from that. But is it really compassion? Or is it a heart that longs to stay comfortable and a knowledge that leaning in, and showing and telling who he is and what he's like might push us into a place that's not comfortable for us? If we realize our primary concern is different from God's primary concern, that should concern us. And why? Okay, be careful. Know what it's not? It's not because if we don't show and tell our neighbors and enemies and family and friends who Jesus is and what he's like, we might get eaten by a fish or sunburned outside of the city. God's going to get us if we don't. That's not the message of the book. That's not the message of the message today. The point is when we live outside our design, we miss God's best for us. Isn't that the idea of the book? God Called Jonah to arise and go because God was on a mission to show the Ninevites the depths of God's compassion to the Ninevites. And also because God was on a mission to show his mercy and the depths of his mercy to Jonah himself. It's what God wanted Jonah to discover. It's why he sent him. And it's why he's sending us. Wherever he's sending us. From your neighborhood to Nineveh to the nations. God isn't just sending you for the sake of the world around you. He's sending us to the world around us for our own sake too. 
Look, the mission of God through us is often the context, the mission of God to us. That's why I tell you, following Jesus is primarily about what you can get out of it. You set your sights and organize your life around just collecting informational facts about God or emotional experiences with God, seeking comfort and blessings from God, you will likely find yourself detoured and distracted and disillusioned from the design of God in your life. But if you'll respond to the calling of God and the mission of God toward the mercy of God to display who he is, what he's like, where he sends you, you tend to find all those other things mixed in. Information, experiences with God, and more blessings than you could possibly imagine. But it works that way in everything, doesn't it? If we just stopped in life at the areas of our discomfort, we would never experience many of the things that we believe in our life are now our biggest blessings, would we? We'd never have learned to walk if we'd stopped when we got uncomfortable. Never have gone on a first date. Never applied for a job, never interviewed for a job. We never would have had children. But deep down, we knew something even greater for us was waiting on the other side of discomfort. And look, I wonder if maybe the same is true when it comes to God's design and his desire in your life. Bo Crisetto makes a similar point in his book, Beyond Awkward. Invites you into a thought experience. Just says, imagine you were sent to your neighborhood. Imagine you were the kind of person that believed that God had placed you in a neighborhood on purpose, around people on purpose, to show who he is and what he's like wherever he sends you. Just imagine it's your neighborhood. And one day you decide you're going to live into it in a way that's kind of uncomfortable for you, so you just decide you're going to go for a walk. And you're going to walk around your neighborhood and ask God, God, if you have a purpose for me, would you show me? Speak to me. And you got this really distinct sense that God was nudging you to go one street over. Okay, just think about how you feel in that moment. Okay, you got an emotion kind of in mind, like that's weird, right? Is that really God? Does God do that kind of thing? You're asking those questions, but you decide there's only one way to know, so I'm just going to go one street over and see what happens. You walk one street over and you look down the street and there's only one person outside in their yard and you get this sense that God's saying, go over and engage that person in a conversation. Okay, what are you feeling in that moment? But you decide... I decided I'm going to push through some unawkward things. So I'm just going to walk on up, and, and you discover that when you get there, that that one person on the street is crying. And you sense that God's saying, ask him a story. You say, what's going on? How do you feel in that moment? And he says, well, I just got a really bad medical diagnosis, and I'm scared, and I feel like I'm alone, and I feel like the bottom has just dropped out of my life. And you say to God, okay, God, what do you have for me here? What are you feeling in that moment? And you sense that God wants you to tell him about God's hope for sinking people and to tell him your story. And so you say, hey, can I tell you my story? How are you feeling in that moment? He says, oh, I love that. So you start into your story. I was sinking, but God, now he. And you sense God wants you to ask him at the end of that if he wants the same kind of hope that you found in the place that you found it. How do you feel in that moment with that question? And he says, yeah, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Do you know how to do that? How do you feel in that moment? Okay, so if you were writing them down, if you were walking through those little emotion trails there, how do you feel? You feel weird and confused. Like, is God talking to me or nudging me to do something? This is weird. Does this happen to people? I don't know. You go from weird and confused to interested. There's only one guy out on the street. To uncomfortable. The dude's crying to really uncomfortable, like you're telling your story, to really, really uncomfortable, I'm not a preacher. How do I help this guy trust in who God is? To exhilarated and pumped because you got to be the person placed in place to see him find hope, right? So notice, it gets kind of dicey there in the middle of the story. But right after uncomfortable and really, really, really uncomfortable, is pumped and exhilarated. Look, people that live into God's design aren't great at it because they somehow decide to 
or figure out a way to make their life never uncomfortable, or they're even extraordinarily gifted. Remember, God used Jonah's terrible message. People God tends to use the most are the ones who are willing to say yes to God's calling and take a step, and to stay engaged in God's mission of mercy for the places that he's placed us and the places that he's sending us, despite our discomfort, because we trust in a God whose mercy towards us and his mercy through us doesn't sink, even when we as messengers stink. Would you bow your head with me? A little more than five-word message today, but for all of us, it's decision time, right? And you know, for some of us, it's decision time to re- because we realize that God's been pursuing us, and we realize that we've lived a life disconnected from the life giver, and that always brings death. And the good news is that God has pursued you to this moment. He's present with you in this moment, and in this moment, he's provided a way out. He sent Jesus to live the life you should have lived and to die as your substitute, to rise from the dead and to offer you forgiveness and life and purpose as a gift that you can receive right where you're at today. And for some of you, today is the day to make that decision. And for some of us today, it's a moment of devotion. We realize we've made a decision. Or we need to make a decision today. And yet there are some steps that we could take today to make sure that we don't drift from that decision. A way to discipline our devotion. What might that look like in your life today? Lord, would you let us be a people who respond who show who you really are and what you're really like in a world that sees lots of caricatures, would you let us live as people who are full of grace and truth that express it because we've experienced it? Would you let us decide to trust in you and even be willing to intentionally choose some discomfort along the way so that we don't drift from our design? Would you let us be people that you send into the world with hope and with mercy, and with life that's truly life, that experience it and express it wherever you send us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.